So let's talk about buying stock on margin. Buying on margin. Um, just to kind of give you a, a little example, let's say somebody wants to buy a home, right? They want to buy a house. And let's say the value of the house is $300,000. That's the value of the home. Most people don't put down cash to buy their home. They finance it. In fact, they might have to put down, let's say, 20%, right? And they may borrow, let's say, 80%. So if they borrow 80%, 80% of 300000 is 240000 That means these people need to come up with equity of 20%. If they're borrowing 80%, they're putting down 20%, which would be $60,000 to buy this home. So with $60,000 in cash, you can see they can buy a $300,000 home. They're basically borrowing 80% of that. Okay. Well, you know how this works. Let's say that the next, very next day after someone bought this home, the value of the home jumped up to $320,000, and they were able to sell it. Well, they're going to make a quick profit, aren't they? Because if they sell their home for $320,000, they only owe $240,000 on that, which means they have $80,000 now in equity. So we can see that the value of the equity changes directly with the value with the change in the value of the asset. If on the other hand the home went from being worth three hundred thousand and instead let's say the value of the home dropped to two hundred and seventy five thousand, well we owe two hundred and forty thousand on it, so the difference is thirty five. So we've got thirty five thousand dollars now in equity. So the point of this exercise is to show you that the amount of equity one has is a function of how much is owed on that asset and what the value of that asset is. Let's go back to our original example here with the value of the home being worth 300000 We know the percentage of equity is 20%. We can confirm that by simply saying, okay, we've got $60,000 in equity and the value of our asset is 300. So our equity in the numerator is a percentage of the value and the denominator is 20%. Let's see how our equity changes. When we went to 320,000 for our second example, we said we have $80,000 in equity. The value of our asset is no longer 300 though, it's 320. So if we take 80, divided by 320, we can see that's a 25%. So we now have 25% equity. When the value of the home dropped down here to 275,000, well that gave us 35,000 in equity and the value of our home is 275. So 30 divided by 275 gives us 12.5 seven three percent approximately we do that again 35 divided by 275 12.73 so again the point of this exercise is to show you that that the equity someone has in an investment is a function of the value of the asset right what's the value of the asset and what's the amount that's owed on it and the difference is how much equity you have and then that equity divided by the value of the asset is the percentage of equity. Let's apply that now to buying stock on margin. Okay, instead of buying a home on margin, we're buying a stock on margin. Margin refers to equity. Margin is is equity. When you buy a stock on margin, there are two different margins. One is the initial margin. And the other is called the maintenance margin. The initial margin and the maintenance margin. The initial margin is the initial equity that has to be uh, put up when you buy the asset. And the maintenance margin is the percentage of equity that must always be maintained. The Federal Reserve sets margin requirements. 
okay? And the Federal Reserve has established <clears throat> that the initial margin requirement must be at least 50% of the purchase price. At least 50%. Individual banks or individual investment firms can charge a different initial margin. They don't have to require 50%. It can be more than 50%, but it has to at least be 50%. So in my example, I'm going to let the initial margin be 60%. That means that if you buy the stock on margin with this firm, you have to put up 60% of the, of the purchase price. The maintenance margin is the amount of equity you must maintain. Let's go back and look at this example when you bought the home on margin. Okay. You know, initially your lender said, hey, you need to put up 20%. When the value of the home started increasing and it increased over here to 320000 there were two people that were happy. You were happy because you bought the home, and your lender was happy because now their loan is secured by a stronger, more valuable asset. So when your equity percentage starts to rise, that's good news. But look what happened when the value of the home dropped to 275. You're not happy, but I can tell you your lender's not happy either because now you only have 12.73% in equity. You've got a $275,000 asset that is securing a $240,000 loan. So when your equity starts declining, you don't like it, but neither does your lender because it puts the lender in a, in a more risky position. You know, what if your value of your home drops below the amount that you owe on it? That becomes pretty problematic. Same over here. If a broker is going to loan you money to buy stock, they're going to require you to put up a certain amount of equity, but they also want you to maintain a certain amount of equity. Uh, the Federal Reserve sets the maintenance margin at 25%. It has to at least be 25%. Again, different brokers can, can establish a different maintenance margin. It just cannot be lower than 25%. I'm going to use 35% for my example. Let's run, through, let's run through a scenario. Let's say you buy an $80 stock on margin. All right? So if you buy $80 stock on margin, that means you have to put up 60%. So $48 is your initial equity. So you put up 48 Well, the stock didn't cost 48 It cost 80 So that means you must be borrowing 40%, right? If you're putting up 60% equity, that means you're borrowing the rest, which is 40%. So $32 is the loan amount. You're borrowing $32 per share to buy this stock. Okay. Let's see. Let's say the stock increases to $85. Let's see how much equity you have, and let's see what the percentage of equity is. Okay, so if the value of the asset is 85, you owe 32, that's the loan amount. The difference is $53. If we take $53 divided by the $85, that's going to give us, I think, 62%, a little over 53, 85 divided, I get 62.2%. 4% approximately. So, if the stock price rises from 80 to 85, we're in a stronger position. We went from having 60% equity to 62.4%. Okay. What if the stock goes the other direction? What if the stock price falls to $70 a share? Well, if you assume we still owe 32 on it, now we've got $38 in equity. So I'm going to write here, this is the value minus the loan gives us the equity. Equity, remember, is margin. So we've got a $38 in equity and a $70 asset. I believe this is going to give us around 54%, 54.3%, if my math is correct. What if the price falls to $62? 
Well, we owe $32. We've got $30 in equity. So $30 in equity and a $62 asset. I believe we are at $48.39. Uh, you know, if the if you bought this stock for for sixty two dollars, and now the price has fallen down here to uh, I'm sorry, you bought the stock for eighty, and the price has dropped to sixty two, you're not really happy, are you? Right? You've lost eighteen dollars in value, but you're not the only one who's concerned. So's the broker who loaned you that money, because their thirty two dollar loan used to be secured by an eighty dollar stock but now your stock has declined at 62. So the question then comes in, I wonder how, what happens if the price keeps falling, right? Right now, the requirement is that you maintain 35% equity, and you are maintaining that because you've got 48.39% in equity. But the question is, how low can the stock price fall? before you violate that agreement. And there's a little formula that you can use where you take the loan amount and when you divide it by one minus the maintenance margin percent. The loan divided by one minus the maintenance margin. Well, the loan in this example is $32. All right, let's come back up here. Here's the loan amount. All right. The maintenance margin in this example is 35%. That's the maintenance margin, 35%. So 1 minus 0.35. That gives us $32 divided by 0.65. And we get $49.23. If the stock price drops, to $49.23, we have exactly enough equity. We have exactly, in this example, 35% equity. Let's confirm that. I'll write down the same thing. The value minus the loan gives us the equity. So if the value of the stock drops to $49.23, we owe $32. That leaves us 1723. If you take 1723 and we divide it by 4923, you get 0.35. So you have exactly 35% equity if the stock price drops to 4923. Hmm. What happens if the stock price drops below 49.23? Well, now you don't have enough equity. And your broker is going to call you and say, you don't have enough equity. You have to deposit more money. You have to put more equity in your account. You're going to get what's called a margin call. If you drop below the maintenance margin percentage, you get a margin call, which requires you to put more funds in your account. Let's keep running through this scenario here. Let's say the price falls to $40 a share. There's going to be a margin call because we've already established that it can only drop to $49.23. If it drops below that, you don't have enough equity. So. The question is, then, how much do you have to deposit? And it's a pretty straightforward couple of calculations. It's not really hard. But I want you, what we're, what we're going to do is, is what we've been doing. Let's figure out how much equity we have. So remember, we've got the value minus the loan tells us how much equity we have. So if the stock has dropped to $40 and we owe $32, that gives us $8.00 in equity. That's how much we actually have. I'm going to call that actually, I'm going to call this our actual equity because that's how much we actually have. How much are we supposed to have? 
Well, remember, when the when we bought this stock on margin, the deal was you put up 60%, but you always have to maintain 35%. You have to maintain 35%. So let's see how much 35% is. How much equity are we supposed to have? This is going to give us our required equity. So if we take $40 times 0.35, this tells us how much equity we're supposed to have. It's $14. Well, we don't have $14. We have 8 So the difference between these two, between what we actually have and what we're required to have, is going to be the margin call. And it's going to be $6 per share. $6 per share. Okay. Okay. Let's see here. All right. Um, loan or equity. Okay, so, yeah, by adding $6 then in equity, that'll bring us back up to 14 Right? So right now we have only $8 in actual equity. When we add $6, it's going to take us to 14 So once we have $14 in equity and the stock is worth $40, 14 divided by 40 is, is 0.35. So we've bought it back up. Once we add in our 6 bucks, it brings us back up to the um, uh, maintenance, the, re the required maintenance level. Okay. So that is buying stock on margin. You know, when you buy stock, that's really kind of a bullish strategy. Bullish meaning that you, you think the price or you're going to profit if the, if the price goes up. You can buy stock by, you know, writing a check, by paying with cash. What we're doing here is buying stock by putting up some cash and borrowing the rest. So, again, we, we're anticipating the price to go up when we buy stock. That's, that's how we're going to benefit, right? But there's another approach to investing, you can make money when the price is expected to go down, if you if you guess correctly. Okay, um, so instead of taking a long position and a long position in stock, you're going to buy the stock. Think about it. If you think the price is going to go up, your, your long-term strategy could be buy it today, the price goes up, and you sell it in the future. You sell it when it gets higher, right? You can make money by taking a long position in the stock. You buy it today, if the price goes up, down the road, when the price is higher, you could sell the stock and you benefit from selling it for more than you paid for it. Alternative, and by the way, that that's a bullish strategy because bullish it has a positive expected payoff when the trend is increasing. Alternatively, you could take a short position in a stock. And you would take a short position if you think that, no, the price isn't expected to go up, but in fact, you expect the price to go down. So the way you take a short position in the stock, it's got some steps. Number one, you need to borrow someone else's stock. Number two, you sell the borrowed stock. Now, you know what happens. If you borrow something, you have to return it. And so if you borrow some stock, you're going to have to replace that stock in the future. But your idea here is to borrow the stock, sell it. And if, in fact, the price goes down, you can buy it back when it's cheaper and replace the stock that you borrowed. And that way you make money. Okay, so you borrow stock, you sell the borrowed stock, and then finally you have to repurchase the stock. And you hope the stock price has gone down, and then you make some money. So let's run through a little example. Let's say you borrow at 80. Price falls to 70. You repurchase. Well, you're going to make some money, aren't you? In fact, 
so you repurchase at at uh, at seventy. You're going to make ten dollars. You got ten dollar profit because you sold something for eighty that you repurchased at seventy. So what do you think the risk is if you take this position? This is called a short sell. What is the risk of a short sell? Well, the risk is that the price doesn't go down, but in fact increases. Okay? I mean, let's say you borrowed at 80. I should have said and sold up here. You borrowed in the 80, at 80 and you sold. And the price increased to $90 a share. Look, you got to return it. You got to replace it at some point. You're going to have a $10 loss. Because at some point, if you if you go ahead and close your position, you're going to close your position by selling the stock, or, or rather by buying the stock back at the higher price. You don't have a choice. You guessed wrong, and the price moved opposite. All right. So that's the mechanics of a short sale. All right. That's the mechanics of a short sale. A um, couple of thoughts here. I'm going to give you a scenario. Let's take a broker here. Um, and here's one of their clients. Okay, we'll let uh, we'll let Bob, whoever Bob is, Bob owns 100 shares of XYZ. So Bob is one of the, the broker's clients. Also, is Sue. Sue is also a client. So Sue contacts the broker and says, "I would like to short." 100 shares of XYZ. Okay? All's good here. Sue contacts the broker and says, I want to short 100 shares of XYZ. The broker says, not a problem. So the broker is going to essentially take shares that are Bob's, kind of in theory. It doesn't work exactly like this. But the broker is going to take Bob's shares and sell them. Okay, and I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to put um, Jim. I'm going to change colors here because Jim, I'm putting him way over here because Jim actually lives in Pennsylvania, and he 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 has his own broker. Okay, so Jim is not associated with with our broker here in purple. Jim is going to buy the shares from Sue. So let's run back through it again. I think I need to name our broker. We'll let our broker be Alex. Okay? So Alex is our broker, and Alex has two clients. One client is Bob, who has 100 shares of XYZ. You've also got Sue, who has her own portfolio. But Sue decides, because she thinks the price of XYZ maybe is overpriced, and thinks that it may decline in value, Sue contacts Alex, the broker, and says, Alex, I want to short 100 shares of XYZ. Um, Alex says, not a problem, because Alex has 100 shares uh, of, from one of his clients. He sells those shares, and, and that money goes, uh, actually sells those shares, and, and Jim, through his broker in Pennsylvania, has purchased those shares. So now Jim is the proud owner of those 100 shares. We know the way this is going to close, at some point, Sue has to go back into the market to close that, doesn't she? She's got to go back in the market and buy those shares so that they can be returned to Bob. Now, I want you to think about this. So let's say during this time period, during the short sale period, actually, let me put some numbers in here. So... Um, she shorted 100 shares of stock. Let's make it at, at uh, $75. Okay? So Sue shorted those shares for $75. Jim bought those shares for $75. Let's say Sue was correct. And let's say the price dropped... Whoop! The price dropped to $70. And Sue closed her position. Okay. Did Sue make some money? Sure. 
Sue made some money. Sue made five dollars. She shorted the assets. She shorted the stock for seventy-five. She thought the price would go down. She was right. The price went down to seventy dollars a share, and Sue closed her position. So she made five dollars, and the shares have been returned to Bob's account. All right, all's good, right? All's good. There is one issue that I want to bring up, and I don't, I don't know that it's talked about in your book, but it's a, it's very relevant. Yeah, actually, it is, and it's has to do with the dividends. Okay, let's assume that during this four months, the the four month short period, let's assume that X Y Z paid a one dollar and fifty cent dividend. All right. Sue borrowed shares from Bob and sold them. Jim bought them. Sue kept waiting and waiting before she closed her position because she thought, you know, I think the price is going to go down. I think it's going to go down. I think it's going to go down. During this time period, the company, XYZ, paid a $1.50 dividend. Sue's hanging on. I think it's going to go down. I think it's going to go down. Finally, boom, it did. It went down, ultimately, all the way down to 70 and she closed her position. So how much profit does Sue make? Well, actually, a moment ago we said Sue made a $5 profit. She actually did not make a $5 profit, though. She made a $3.50 profit. Because the short seller, Sue in this example, is responsible for dividends that were paid. If you think about it, who is XYZ going to pay the dividend to? Well, Jim. Jim owns the shares. Jim is going to receive the dividend because he owns the shares. Who thinks they're getting a dividend? Well, Bob does because he doesn't even know his shares have been used in this short sell position. He's unknowing. And it's all legitimate because he signed an agreement that allowed his shares to be used in such transactions. But Jim, or rather Bob, is expecting to receive a $1.50 dividend because he knows he owns 100 shares and there's a $1.50 dividend being paid. So that's why Sue must pay the dividend. Sue's responsible for the dividend essentially to Bob. She's basically going to pay the broker and then the broker is going to pay Bob. But Sue is responsible to pay a $1.50 dividend. And it makes sense. She borrowed those shares from Bob. Bob would have received the dividend. So Sue is responsible for those dividends. So in this case, Sue's profit is going to be $3.50. She sold it for $75. She bought it back for $70. So that's $5. But she's responsible for the dividend. So it's $3.50. All right. Okay. Now, the next part we're going to do here is we're going to talk about margins because when you buy stock on margin, remember you have to put up equity. Well, guess what? If you short somebody's asset, if you short an asset, you also have to have some margin. There's some margin requirements. There has to be. Otherwise, you have no risk. You could walk away from a bad transaction. So you are required to put up a certain amount of equity. So I'm going to assume again the initial margin is going to be 60%. Um, and I'll let my maintenance margin be 35%. Okay. So let's say someone borrows. an $80 stock. Okay. And they sell it. So let's figure out first how much this person, how much cash is going to be, this will be Sue, how much cash is going to be in Sue's account? Well first, as soon as the broker sells that stock, the broker puts $80 in cash. 
in Sue's account. She can't go spend it, right? I mean, they, they've sold that stock, and that cash is sitting in her account. Plus, since she's required to put up 60%, that's the, the initial margin, she has to put up 60% of 80, which is $48. So this is 60% of 80. So right away, there's $128 per share total cash in the account. All right. Um, and so we, we know that Sue's got 60% equity because she's got six uh, she's got $48 of her money that she's put up towards this and the value of the stock that's owed is 80 and so she's got 60 percent initial equity okay all right let's assume the stock price Remember, the risk for the short seller isn't that the price will go down. The, the short seller expects the price to go down. The risk is if the price goes up. So let's assume that the stock price uh, increases to $90 a share. Okay. Let's figure out how much equity this short seller has. How much equity do they have? Well, remember, they've got $128 in the account. It came from the sale of the stock at 80 uh, and the $48 that they put up. So they've got $128. But now, since the price has gone to 90 they're going to have to buy back shares worth $90. So really, what they've got is $38 in equity. And again, they owe $90 per share. So they've got $38 in equity and a $90 obligation that they're going to owe. So 38 divided by 90 is 42.2%. We can see that this person, the short seller's position, their equity position, has dropped. At one point, they had 60% of equity, and now they've dropped to 42.2% equity. What if the price, let's assume, the price increases to $100? Let's see what their equity position is. Well, again, they owe, no, I'm sorry, they've got 128 bucks on hand. The initial 80 that was put in their account plus the $48 they put in. But they owe $100. So they really only have $28 in equity, and they owe $100. So they have 28% equity. Well, what do you think is going to happen now? Well, look over here. The maintenance margin is 35%. Initially, this person had 60%. Then, because the price rose, it, it dropped to 42.2%. And now, because the stock price kept rising, this person has only 28%. That's less than 35%. So there's going to be a margin call. There's going to be a margin call. All right. Hmm. I wonder how much the margin call is going to be. What's the margin call going to be? Well, what we need to do is, let's see here. Yeah, if, let's figure out the margin call right here if the price has risen to $100. Okay, what we need, what we know is, I'm going to change and we'll come over here to the right now. Remember, we've got $128 in the account. 
He comes from the $80 cash that we when we sold the asset, and the $48 that that we that we had to initially put up. So we've got 128. But we're going to need something else because there's going to be a margin call amount. In fact, I may say MC to stand for margin call. So that's the total cash that we're going to need, and then we subtract the hundred dollars because if the stock price has risen to a hundred, right? We've got 128 plus whatever we need to put in, minus the hundred divided by 100, and that needs to equal 35 percent. So. Basically, the same same approach that we've been doing. Look right here, 128 minus 90. We took 128 because that's how much cash, total cash we have in our account, minus the $90 because we owe $90 per share. And so now what we're trying to do is simply say, well, how much more money do I need to put in over here so that I will have 35%? So we just solve for this like an algebra problem. $128 minus $100 plus the margin call equals $35. All I did here was rearrange, you know, the numerator, and then I multiplied the $100 times 0.35 to move the $100. You know, basically I multiplied both sides times $100. So now I've got $28 plus my margin call equals 35. Guess what the margin call is? The margin call equals $7. 35 minus 28. So the margin call in this example is going to be $7 per share. Let's do one more. Let's say the price increases to $98 a share. 98. Um, well, let's see first if there's going to be a margin call. So we need to figure out how much equity there is. So we take the $128 minus the 98 divided by 98. $30 divided by 98. And I get, did I do that right? 30.6. Let's see, 128 minus 98. That's 30. Yep, divided by, I'm sorry, 30 divided by 98 gives me 0 0.306. There's going to be a margin call, isn't there? Because 30.6 is less than our maintenance margin up here of 35. So how much is the margin call going to be? Well, we've currently got 128. We need to add some margin call amount. And then we've, you know, again, we owe $98 per share. And that needs to equal 0.35. So in the numerator, I've got 128. I'm just going to rearrange a little bit. Minus 98 plus my margin call is equal to 98 times 0.35. 98.35 times. That gives me $34 over here. $34.30. So this is $30 plus my margin call equals 34.43. So your margin call is equal to $4.30 per share. One last thing, and then we shall part ways. And that is, you know, how, at what point do you receive a margin call? What we saw earlier is that we, we, we sold the stock for 80 bucks. When it went to 90, we didn't have a margin call. When it went to 100, we did have a margin call. So it's somewhere between 90 and 100. Actually, when it went to 98, there was a margin call. So somewhere between $90 a share and $98 a share, we 
that's the price at which we're going to have a margin call, or the, the highest the price can rise without there being a margin call. The simple formula to get there is 1 plus the initial margin divided by 1 plus the maintenance margin times the original stock price, the price at which you shorted the stock. I'll call it P PO, where 0 represents the, the price at the beginning of the period. So that was how much it was sold for. So in our example, I believe it was 60. Let's go back and see it. 60% is our initial margin. I'm looking up here. 60% is our initial margin. 35% is our maintenance margin. And the original, we, we shorted this asset at $80 a share. So 1.6 divided by 1.35 times $80. This gives me $94.815 approximately. And that falls between 90 and 98. The stock price, we hope it doesn't increase. As a short seller, we're hoping that the price is going to go down and we make money. If, the, if we're wrong and the price doesn't go down but instead starts to climb, we've seen that it can climb to $94.81 before there's a margin call. If it climbs above 94.815, there's going to be a margin call.